Welcome, everybody. I'm here on behalf of the Royal Economic Society to welcome you to the Manchester Hub events today. Um, my name is Denise Osborne. I'm Secretary General of the Royal Economic Society. So I want to welcome both the participants here in Manchester and those who are joining us online for this, uh, for this lecture. Uh, the annual conference is, a, is an important event for the Royal Economic Society, as well as the academic sessions, the networking opportunities are very important and hence we've got hubs this year and hope that you in, those of you who are here are able to take advantage of the network, networking, enjoy it. Uh, I just want to take a moment to thank everybody involved in organising this, the, the uh, local organisers here at, at Manchester, Nuno Palmer, Carlos Ramirez and of course the Head of Department, Akos Valentini. Uh, there's also people behind the scenes and just to thank those without naming them and also of course the RES staff and the overall conference organisers who are also always crucial in this. And finally I'd just like to say it's great to be back in Manchester. I was an academic here for all of my academic career. I retired about eight years ago so I don't come up to Manchester very often anymore but Manchester's a great place and welcome everybody. And now I'm going to hand over to Akos, who's going to introduce our, our speaker for the lecture. Thank you, Akos. Give it to. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure uh, for me to introduce uh, today uh, in-person hub speaker, Professor Oda Galore, <coughs> who is going to talk about where human wealth comes from and how to distribute it more equally. So these are fundamental questions uh, uh, in which we, as economists, should all uh, be interested in uh, because it sheds more light not only on the history of humanity but also uh, today's problem of uh, humanity. And there is no better person to talk about this uh, uh, than uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Galore, who is the Herbert Goldberger Professor of Economics at Brown uh, University, Fellow of the Econometric Society, and he is uh, one of the most influential economists in the field of uh, uh, growth uh, and uh, uh, development. He is the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Economic Growth, he established in uh, 1995, and, and which is uh, the leading uh, journal in the field of uh, uh, growth and uh, development. He uh, developed uh, the unified growth theory and also provided huge amount of empirical evidence to underpin this theory. Professor Gal, the floor is yours. Well, so thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here and uh, to share with you insights that I gathered over the past uh, three decades of research. Research that uh, just appeared in a popular science book that is read readily accessible to uh, the wide public, but at the same time for specialists in the field. So the journey of humanity explores the evolution of human societies in the past uh, 300,000 years since the emergence of modern human in Africa, um, as I said, very long ago. And in fact, it focuses on two mysteries that surround this journey. The first mystery I will define as the mystery of growth, namely, what are the roots of this dramatic transformation in the standard of living that occurred in the past 200 years after literally hundreds of thousands of years of stagnation. And the second mystery is the mystery of inequality. Namely, what is the origin of this vast inequality in the standard of living across the globe? Now, over most of human existence, to a large extent, Human life was nasty, brutish, and short, as suggested by Hobbes. In fact, it was remarkably similar to that of any other species on planet Earth. Humans were preoccupied by survival and reproduction. Living standards were very close to the subsistence level. And living conditions did not differ greatly across time and across space. In fact, only a few centuries ago, one-fourth of newborn 
did not reach their first birthday, and one half of them did not reach their reproductive age. About one-tenth of women perish during childbirth. And life expectancy fluctuated in a very narrow range of 25 to 40 and rarely exceeded 40. And perhaps most strikingly, this was a period in which economic crisis did not lead into, into belt tightening. It led to mass starvation and ultimately extinction. Now, suddenly, over the past 200 years, we see this incredible metamorphosis, an incredible change in living conditions across, uh, across the planet. Income per capita in the world increases by a factor of 14. Life expectancy has more than doubled, and a huge divergence emerged in the world economy in the context of the standard of living. Now, to illustrate this metamorphosis, consider for a moment citizens of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus, Roman Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, and whisk them in a time machine nearly 2,000 years forward to Ottoman Jerusalem at the beginning of the 19th century. Despite this 2,000-year jump, these individuals will be able to adapt instantaneously to the new environment. In fact, past knowledge will be largely applicable, new technologies will represent incremental change and will allow e people to adapt quite rapidly, occupations would require very similar skills, and life expectancy would remain unchanged, and as a result of it would not require a change in the mindset of individuals. But now, it takes this individual from Ottoman Jerusalem of the 19th century and bring them to Jerusalem of today. Only 200 year jump forward. This would be a devastating experience, a shocking experience. Past knowledge, to a large extent, will be obsolete. New technologies would appear to these individuals as an act of witchcraft. Occupations would require largely incomprehensible skills. And life expectancy would instantly double, and as a result of it would require an entirely different mindset. Education decisions, saving decisions, life cycle decisions. So something very dramatic occurred in the world economy in the past 200 years. And in contrast to some conventional wisdom, it is not the case that living standard increased gradually in the course of human existence. Technological progress did increase gradually over the course of human existence, but it resulted in larger population, not richer population. And in fact, what we see in the course of the past 200 years reflect what I will define as a phase transition, namely an abrupt transformation once a certain tipping point has been reached. Now, to illustrate this change, Consider the evolution of income per capita in the past 200 years, at uh, the past 2,000 years. And what you will observe is something very striking. Over most of human existence, income per capita is fluctuating, perhaps with minor trend, around subsistence. And then suddenly a major eruption is taking place 200 years ago. In fact, if I would have removed the labeling of this axis, and I would show it to a random scientist, then people will feel that the output that we see here is an output of a seismograph that detects tectonic activity and a major eruption. But in fact, this is the evolution of income per capita in the course of human history. But interestingly enough, when the takeoff is taking place, it does not take place in all places across the globe. Some regions of the world are taking off first, Western Europe and their offshoots. Other regions of the world are taking off much later, if at all. And since this takeoff is associated on average with a 14-fold increase in income per capita, a huge divergence is emerging in the world economy. And therefore, if you would like to understand the roots of inequality today, we will have to ask ourselves what brought about this differential transformation in 
uh, across uh, regions of the world. So naturally, the resolution of these two mysteries that I just posed would require the identification of the forces that permitted first the transition from stagnation to growth, the identification of the forces that led into the differential timing of the transition across the globe, and ultimately the identification of the role of deep-rooted factors, factors that operated hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, and even tens of thousands of years ago in understanding inequality as we see it today. And because of that, we will need, in fact, to step back and to ask ourselves, what can we say about the journey of humanity and why the journey of humanity led into this divergence that occurred in the past 200 years? So when we think about the journey of humanity as a whole, we can divide the phases of development into three fundamental regimes. The first one can be defined as the Malthusian epoch. It lasted over 99.9% .9 of human existence. This is an epoch that is characterized by interesting dualism, stagnation in living standards, along with certain dynamism in technology, in population, and in human adaptation. Then the world is moving into the post-Maltusian regime and ultimately into the modern growth regime in which uh, uh, many of the societies of the world are currently operating. So as I said, the Malthusian epoch originates with the emergence of anatomically modern human in Africa nearly 300,000 years ago. And it lasts till the eve of industrialization, 17th century, the 18th century, and what we see during this time period, as I said, is interesting dualism, stagnation along with uh, dynamism. At a certain point, this dynamism that I am referring to, the dynamism in the context of technological progress, the dynamism in the context of population, and the dynamism in the context of human adaptation, is leading into the takeoff that occurs in the course of the post maltusian regime. And ultimately, it is the onset of the demographic transition that frees the growth process from the counterbalancing effect of population and permit the world to move into the sustained growth regime. So naturally, the key for the understanding of much of the inequality that we see across the globe today are the forces that operated during the Malthusian epoch and ultimately led into the, this differential timing of the takeoff from stagnation to growth. So as I said, the Malthusian epoch is characterized by this fascinating dualism. Stagnation on the one hand and dynamism on the other. So we see stagnation in living standards, income per capita fluctuate trendlessly around uh, the subsistence level, life expectancy fluctuates in a very narrow range of 25 to 40. But at the same time, we see great dynamism. Technology is advancing. The size of the human population gets larger and larger. And human, humans are adapting to the technological and the geographical environment. Now, at any point in time, the rate of technological progress is very, very small. The rate of population growth is very small, and human adaptation is very small. But over a 300,000-year period, we are moving from stone tool technologies to steam engine technologies. We are moving from a population of 2.5 million people in the eve of the agricultural revolution 12,000 years ago to about 1 billion people in the course of industrialization a 400-fold increase in the size of the human population that is naturally supported by more and more advanced technologies. And it is this Malthusian dynamism that ultimately rescues humanity from the arms of the Malthusian octopus and permits humanity to move from stagnation to growth. So naturally, it is critical to understand the three wheels of change, if you wish, that brought about the transition from stagnation to growth and ultimately rescue humanity from, as I said before, the arms of this Malthusian octopus. And the first element is the impact 
of technology on the scale of the population. So when technological progress occurred in the distant past, it generated a temporary increase in income per capita. You introduce new tools, new seeds, new crops. Naturally, the output that you had as a result of it was larger than otherwise. But this output ultimately permitted more of your children to survive, allowed you to have more children than otherwise, and consequently, income per person reverted back to the previous equilibrium position. And consequently, during this Malthusian epoch, technologically advanced societies or land-rich societies have higher population density, but very similar level of income per capita. And the data is striking about this. If you look at the relationship between land productivity on the one hand and, say, population density during the Malthusian epoch in the, time in the year 1500, you see this pronounced positive association between land productivity and population density. But if you look at the relationship between land productivity and income per capita in 1500, there is no association between the two. And the same is true for technology. If you look at technology in the year 1500 and its impact on population density in 1500, positive impact. If you look at the relationship between technology and income per capita, no association. So again, during the Malthusian epoch, Technologically advanced societies have higher population density, but largely similar levels of income per capita. And that's striking. The second wheel of change is, in fact, the human adaptation. So when technology is advancing over this time period, as I said a moment ago, it increases the size of the population. But in addition, it contributes to the adaptation of the human population. Namely, we see gradual change in the composition of the human population. So why is it so? Well, traits that were complementary to the growth process tautologically generated higher income. And in the Malthusian epoch, higher income was converted into higher reproductive success. And consequently, this trait became more and more prevalent in the human population. And consequently, human adaptation raised the prevalence of complementary traits to the growth process and ultimately fostered the growth process and reinforced the transition from stagnation to growth. That's the second component. The certain third component is, in fact, the origins of technological progress. And technological progress over this time period was based on two important elements the scale of the population on the one hand, and the composition of the population on the other hand. Larger population implies greater supply of innovations, more demand for innovations, greater diffusion of knowledge, better division of labor and trade, and via reverse engineering, technological progress. So over the course of human history, and in particular in the Malthusian epoch, we see this reinforcing inter interaction between, on the one hand, population size and population composition and technological progress. Larger population and more adapted population brings about technological progress, but in, on the other hand, greater technological progress increases the size of the population and the adaptation of the human population. So these wheels of change are turning in the course of human history and gradually the pace of technological progress becomes faster and faster and faster. And as I said before, we move from stone tool technologies 300,000 years ago to steam engine technologies in the eve of industrialization. But at a certain point, technological progress accelerates beyond the tipping point, beyond the re a threshold point. And beyond this point, in order to navigate this rapidly changing technological environment, individuals must start to invest in their education, in their, the human capital of their children. Why? Because again, education permits individuals to navigate this rapidly changing technological environment. Human capital starts to form 
But naturally, human capital is not manna from heaven. It's not, it's not free. It is costly. People have limited budget. They have to economize on other elements. They live very close to the subsistence. They cannot feed themselves uh, um, less than before. And as a result of it, they are forced to reduce the size of their, their families. So we see that there is a reduction in fertility. And abruptly, the Malthusian equilibrium simply vanishes. And the world is free to move into the modern growth regime. So now technological progress for the first time in human history is converted into richer people rather than into more people. And if you wish, these three forces, technological progress, human capital formation, and the decline in population growth are operating in the movement towards the sustained growth regime. And you can see it in this illustration very, very easily. So we have certain size of population in Africa 300,000 years ago. Sooner or later, people start to innovate and technological progress starts to move forward. Technological progress, on the other hand, contribute to more people and more adaptable people. So the wheels of change are operating beneath the surface for a long period of time. The return to human capital gradually increases. But the return to human capital is so small that people are not acting upon this return till a tipping point is being reached. And the return to human capital is such that people decide to start to invest in the education of their children. In the context of, uh, of England, we see this massive investment in public schooling in the midst of the, uh, of the 19th century. And ultimately, this contributes to the demographic transition, freeing the growth process from the counterbalancing effect of population and moving into the modern growth regime. Now, in order to better understand this notion of phase transition, think for a moment about phase transition that is familiar to all of us, the transition from liquid to gas. So as we boil water, okay, at a certain point, the water reaches a temperature, a temperature that is a tipping point in which we see the conversion of motor, water molecules from liquid to gas. Very similarly, in the course of human history, we see this technological progress becoming faster and faster and faster. The return to human capital increases gradually, but it doesn't make a difference for a long period of time till it reaches a critical point above which we see this transition from the agricultural stage of development to the modern stage of development. So this is a phase transition, which is basically the entire idea behind unified growth theory, is to generate basically the past that occurred in the course of human history, starting with few individuals that operated in Africa and moving to the present. But the critical ingenuity in unified growth theory is the, the introduction of bifurcation theory and phase transition so as to describe the escape from a stable Malthusian equilibrium. Because naturally, if in fact the world was in a stable equilibrium for most of its existence, how do we see suddenly a spontaneous takeoff? In some sense, it's a contradiction in terms. We cannot escape a stable equilibrium. And the ingenuity here was precisely the notion of a phase transition based on bifurcation of equilibrium. But one important element. When the transition occurs from water to gas, not all water molecules are evaporating at the same speed. Some are evaporating earlier than others. And as a result of it, we see divergence between these molecules. The same occur occurred in the world economy. When the takeoff took place, not all societies are experiencing this takeoff at once. And as a result of it, an enormous divergence is occurring in the world economy. Now, when you think about the march of humanity that I describe, namely the transition from humans that existed in Africa 300,000 years ago to the societies that we have today, it appears to a large extent that the march of humanity has been unstoppable. In what sense? Naturally, humanity experienced devastating effects in the past. Think about the Black Death decimating 40% of the European population, and naturally, as, 
in the aftermath of the Black Death, we see that humanity is in fact propelling forward with greater resolve and with greater strength. In the 20th century, World War I and World War II are decimating tens of millions of people in Europe and in other places across the globe. And naturally, once again, we see that despite these enormous tragedies and despite the trauma that people that went through these processes experience, humanity as a whole is able to continue to march forward with, uh, with greater resolve. So naturally, these events are devastating in the, in the short run, undoubtedly, but ultimately, they have limited impact on the grand arc of human history. So in this respect, the journey of humanity, my book that was just released a few days ago in England, is providing a very optimistic outlook about the future. Suggests to us, for instance, that if you think about the humanitarian crisis that is now uh, uh, devastating the Ukrainian people and naturally all of us. This is indeed a devastating experience and the Ukrainian people may, may suffer from it for years, decades uh, to come. But nevertheless, I mean the gloom that is surrounding this crisis, the idea that perhaps we are reaching uh, a new bifurcation point that is going to derail humanity from its long-term march, I think is, is misplaced. History suggests to us that it is very unlikely to derail humanity from its path. But, naturally, there is a looming crisis in the horizon that has the potential to derail humanity from its long-run march, and this is climate change. And here, too, the journey of humanity provides a hopeful outlook. So think about it for a moment. It is technological progress that is bring about, bringing about industrialization, and industrialization via industrial pollution is bringing them out about climate change. But technological acceleration also brought three additional components. It brought human capital formation that was absent earlier. It brought the power of innovations that is so important. And in fact, this power of innovations was very important in terminating to a large extent the crisis that we just faced in the past two years. If COVID-19 would have occurred two centuries ago, it was probably, it would have lasted over a prolonged period of time and it would devastate enormously the human population. But here we are with the power of innovation, mRNA technologies are developing and allowing us in fact to live our life as we live it today. Now, an additional aspect of technological acceleration, as I said earlier, is the decline in fertility rates. And this is very important because, in fact, we are polluting planet Earth. So if, in fact, we have a decline in population growth, and if, in fact, fertility is dropping below replacement universally, and, in fact, India just dropped below replacement, then the forces that are behind uh, climate change are becoming uh, less important than before. Now, this is not a call for complacency, on the, other, on, on the contrary. So, if in fact we are exploiting the fact that fertility is declining, and in fact we, are in, we will invoke policies that will expedite fertility decline, and if we will adopt environmentally friendly technologies, then in fact we can buy the necessary time for scientists to develop these revolutionary technologies that perhaps will turn this climate crisis into a fading memory decades from now, perhaps a century from now. So again, hopeful outlook, hopeful outlook, but not a naive one and not one that calls for complacency. Climate change is a serious matter, and, uh, but nevertheless, at the time that climate change is starting, in fact, we see other changes in the world economy that provide some hope for the resolution of this crisis. So, so far, I talked about the march of humanity forward. We started with an atomically modern human in Africa 300,000 years ago, and we moved to the present. In the second part of the book, I talk about the roots of inequality. I try to resolve the mystery of inequality. And there, I take, in fact, 
a different course of action. So initially, we move forward in time from 300,000 <laughs> years uh, uh, ago to the present. And now, in fact, I start at the present. I look at the inequality as we see it today. And gradually, I remove different layers of influence to understand the roots of this inequality. So as I said before, much of the inequality that you see today is originated in the differential timing of the transition from stagnation to growth. And this differential timing are associated with certain barriers in the process of accumulation, in the process of technological progress, etc. So naturally, it's very tempting to say, well, there is uneven development across the globe, and this uneven development is based on differences in education, differences in, in, the, uh, in physical capital formation, and different differences in technological level. But this doesn't take us anywhere. The question, of course, is why some societies fail to invest efficiently in physical and human capital formation? Why some societies fail to adopt advanced technologies? And this brings us into the historical and prehistorical barriers in the process of development, namely into deeper roots that operated hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, and as you shall see momentarily, tens of thousands of years ago. So the deeper roots will take us into institutional factors and cultural factors, and the ultimate roots will take us into geographical and societal characteristics. So let's start our march and try to peel different layers of influence. So the first layers, layer of influence that comes to mind is what I will define as the fingerprints of institutions. So naturally, at a certain point in time, we see the emergence of these differential institutions across the globe. Some societies are adopting growth-enhancing, inclusive institutions. Other, growth-retarding, uh, extractive institutions. And naturally, some of the differences that we see across the globe has to do with these differential institutions. But it is important to note that institutions are rarely manna from heaven. They are rarely exogenous. Yes, there are some instances in which institutions are emerging at critical junctures in human history that are rather random. For instance, if we think about the impact of the Black Death, on the scarcity of labor, and ultimately in the decline of feudalism in the UK. This ultimately contributed to the emergence of property rights and perhaps to early industrialization in, in England. Or if you think about the Glorious Revolution, then this led into constitutional monarchy in, in, the, in England and ultimately perhaps into early industrialization. Or if you think about the division of the Korea along the 38th parallel, Naturally, this led into a communist hell in the north and uh, a pseudo-heaven in the south. So certainly we can think about a counterfactual history in which William of Orange would have been defeated by James II and then the Glorious Revolution would not have occurred and perhaps uh, industrialization would not have occurred in England. But as I said, these are the rarity. Okay, we can name these episodes on maybe one hand, perhaps two. Okay? But institutions have most, mostly evolved gradually, and they adjusted to the environment in which people operated. Naturally, the Neolithic Revolution, the transition to agriculture, increased population density enormously and generated the demand for institutions that can coordinate between individuals and can ultimately secure their property rights, allow cooperation, and allow the, uh, the uh, implementation of important public goods. Or you can think about the suitability of land for large plantations. Naturally, this led into large land concentration and ultimately into the emergence of extractive institutions and the horrific institution of slavery. Namely, it is the political power that ultimately uh, um, uh, had the landed aristocracy had that permitted them to implement certain type of institutions rather than others. Well, you can think about the disease environment as we see in sub-Saharan Africa and its, its adverse impact on the delay in the adoption of centralized institutions. So broadly speaking, yes, there are some instances in which we can see 
critical junctures, random critical junctures in which institutions are emerging in a differential way across the globe, but institutions to a large extent are a byproduct of the process of development and we should treat them as such. So this leads us into the different a different or deeper layer of influence, which is the cultural factor. And here too, we can think about the emergence of differential cultural traits across regions. So perhaps growth enhancing traits such as social capital in one region of the world and growth retarding cultural traits such as family ties uh, in another region of the world. And this was naturally used in order to explain the Italian divide between the north and the south. But again, cultural traits are rarely manna from heaven. They're predicated on earlier conditions. So there are some instances, again, of random growth enhancing cultural mutations, if you, if you wish. And this is true in the context of Judaism. In the first century, we see the imposition of mandatory literacy requirement that has no economic meaning and no economic uh, um, setting. And nevertheless, ultimately, this cultural mutation persists because it becomes very beneficial later on in the course of human history as the demand for education becomes so important. We can see it even in the context of the Protestant Reformation, although the Protestant Reformation cannot be really viewed as a random mutation. Naturally, it is in the context of religious competition at the time. But the Protestant Reformation is associated with the emergence of thrift, entrepreneurship, and what some defined as the spirit of capitalism. But importantly, cultural traits predominantly evolve due to the adaptation of these traits to the geographical environment, the economic environment, the institutional environment. So when the return to human capital increase in the course of human history, we see that the predisposition towards child quality is increasing. When agricultural return to crop cultivation is higher than otherwise, individuals are induced to be engaged in planting and harvesting, and as a result of it, adapt to the need to be future-oriented. And future-oriented mindset is developing over this time period. And this, as you know, is perhaps the most critical element in the growth process. Education decisions are controlled by it, saving decisions, adoptions of technologies, etc. Climatic volatility affects naturally the degree of loss aversion in society and as a result of it entrepreneurial spirit. Or the suitability of the land for the use of the plow is affecting the adoption of the plow and given the fact that the plow requires upper body strength, it gives basically a comparative advantage for men in agricultural production and confining women to, uh, to, work, uh, to work at home, and ultimately leading into gender biases that are persistent to the present. So again, we cannot view cu the cultural factor as the, uh, as the deepest truth. It's a factor that is affected predominantly by the geographical environment. So this leads us into the shadow of geography, namely geographical characteristics such as soil quality, the disease environment, and even geographical isolation that naturally have a direct impact on economic development. It affects labor productivity, it affects human capital formation, and it affects trade and technological adoption. But again, perhaps the most important element in the context of uh, geography, its indirect impact on the emergence of cultural and institutional characteristics. Now, as we move further back and we try to peel layers of influence, we are led into the onset of the agricultural revolution 12,000 years ago. And as we know, during the transition of humanity into the agricultural uh, uh, stage of development, we see the emergence of a non-food producing class that is associated with knowledge creation in the form of science, in the form of technology, in the form of written languages, and this generates technological head start that persists over time. And consequently, some argued, and this is uh, the thesis that was advanced by Jerry Diamond, that variation in the timing of the Neolithic Revolution across the globe are associated with the variation in economic prosperity as we see today. 
Now, it turns out, in fact, that the diamond hypothesis is quite powerful in explaining variations till the Middle Ages. But in fact, in the post-1500 period, the diamond hypothesis is entirely mute. It has zero explanatory power for the variations in inequality as we see it today. And why is it so? It is so because during the uh, Neolithic Revolution, indeed, Societies are generating technological head start on the one hand, which is very important, but on the other hand, they generate comparative advantage in agriculture. And as societies are moving from agriculture to industry, most of the technological spillovers are associated with industrial production. And consequently, there is an adverse effect of the early transition to the Neolithic that is offsetting the positive effect of technological progress. And ultimately, the effect of the Neolithic Revolution on contemporary variations in income per capita is virtually zero. Now, as we continue to peel the layers of influence, we are drawn ultimately back to where we all originated from, namely back to Africa, and to the exodus of anatomically modern human from Africa 60 to 90,000 years ago. And this migratory process led into a situation in which populations that departed further and further from Africa had lower level of diversity. And why is it so? So during the exodus from Africa, departing population carried only a subset of the original diversity that existed in Africa. And why is it so? The size of the population in Africa was limited. The departing population was limited, and as we know from statistical theory, if you have basically limited sampling from a limited distribution, it's not a representative sample. Some of the diversity is being lost. And this is a very broad notion of diversity. Cultural diversity, phenotypic diversity, behavioral diversity, linguistic diversity. And since migration was sequential, the further people departed from Africa, the less diverse they were. And the empirical regularity is striking, as you will see momentarily. So people are originated from Africa with a certain level of diversity. They depart into, say, the nearby Fertile Crescent with lower level of diversity. And then as they continue their march, those that arrive into South America are the least diverse in the world. And here are the evidence. If you look at migratory distance from Africa in ten thousands of kilometers, the further you are from Africa, the less diverse you are, regardless of how you measure diversity, culturally, behaviorally, etc. Now, why is it so important? It is important because diversity is associated with two conflicting effects. On the one hand, there are beneficial effects of diversity on creativity and innovations due to cross-fertilization of ideas and complementarity of, of, of traits in the production process. But on the other hand, there are adverse effects of, of diversity on social cohesiveness. It generates mistrust, disagreement about the desirable public goods, and ultimately conflicts. And as a result of it, if we have positive and diminishing effect of diversity on innovations, and positive and diminishing effects of homogeneity on social cohesiveness, it implies that one should expect to find a hump-shaped relationship between migratory distance from Africa and comparative development. And this is precisely what the data is showing us, regardless of how we cut the data. If you look at the year 1500, population density in 1500 in relation to, uh, in relation to diversity, as you can see, there is a hump-shaped relationship. If you focus on urbanization in 1500, the same type of relationship, or income per capita today, the same type of relationship. But importantly, as we move from the year 1500 to the present, the optimal level of diversity, the level of diversity that is conducive for productivity is increasing in this process. Why is it so? Because we move into a more demanding environment technologically, and consequently the benefits of diversity in terms of innovations is much more important than the mitigation of the cost of diversity. And this is a prediction for the future too, as we move into a more demanding technological environment and as we mitigate the cost of diversity by educating our children to be respectful to one another and to be respectful for difference, then the optimal level of diversity will further increase. So in the past, the optimal level of diversity was associated with the diversity level, say, in China, 
Korea and Japan, places that we do not consider as optimally diverse. And the reason is that, in fact, at the time, technological progress was not very rapid and social cohesiveness was much, much more important than, than, uh, than innovativeness. But in today's world, the sweet spot of diversity is associated with the level of diversity that we see in the US or in the UK, namely much more diverse societies. And this is true regardless if we look at countries or all ethnic groups in the ethnographic atlas. In fact, look at any, every thousand years, from the year 10,000 BC to the present, you can see this pronounced hump-shaped relationship between diversity and development. So overall, if you think about the wheels of change, they were turning population size and the population composition affected technological progress and were affected by technological progress. But they interacted with the institutional and cultural factors, they interacted with the migration from Africa, and they interacted with human geography. And that's the reason that we do not see the same timing of the takeoff across the globe. These factors, deep-rooted factors, affected the variations as we see it across the globe. So when you think about the roots of comparative development, empirically we can show the deep-rooted factors accounts for nearly 90% of the variations in income per capita today. Okay? And if we think about it in the context of the chronology of the, uh, of the events, go as deep as possible, the dispersal of anatomically modern humans from Africa accounts for 17 to 26 percent of the unexplained variation in Inca per capita today. Time since human settlement and the Neolithic Revolution, about 3 percent. It's not the Neolithic, it's the time since settlement. Geographical factors, a huge, fact, a huge force, 27 to 38 percent. Disease ecology, 10 to 15 percent cultural factors about 20%, and political institutions in the form of executive constraints and polity for around 3 to 9%. So as you can see, this is an holistic view. All forces are important okay, to the understanding of inequality across the globe today. But importantly, as I said, much of the variations in income per capita across the globe today can be traced to forces that operated hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, and even tens of thousands of years ago. Now, let me conclude by stating the following. Does it imply that we have historical determinism? Not at all. In fact, the insight from the journey of humanity, generally, and from my book, The Journey of Humanity, will permit us to design growth-enhancing policies, country-specific policies, history-specific policies that will in fact mitigate and will close the gap in the wealth of nations. In what sense? So when the World Bank is pushing certain policies today, they push the idea that let's educate the population, let's assure that we have proper family planning. These are wonderful policies. But resources are limited and the question is how do we structure the education policies? And here, knowing the history of each individual country is very critical. Think about it. If, in fact, you're targeting a very diverse society across the globe, Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, I would like the education policy to be geared towards social cohesiveness. I would like to mitigate the cost of diversity. I would like to emphasize tolerance, respect for difference, respect for other ethnic groups. But if I take another society like Bolivia, that is the most homogeneous one in the sample, in fact, I would like to target precisely the opposite uh, elements. Namely, I would like to foster pluralism. I would like to cause people to think out of the box. I would like them to challenge the status quo. Similarly, if you think about policies that are fostering growth-enhancing cultural traits, if in fact there is a particular society that was not blessed, blessed by geographical endowment that was conducive for long-term orientation or future-oriented mindset that is so critical for the growth process, let's focus on it. Namely, let's assure that this society is get, getting a curriculum that is designed to foster future-oriented mindset. Some societies got it from nature, other society did not, and as a result of it, we can push this. Or if, in fact, gender equality is lacking because of the adoption of the plow, then again, 
target more gender equality in this type of society. So the idea is that rather than having one policy that fit all societies, let's target each society individually, and that's the way to go. So interestingly enough, when we think about progressive policies, then typically we want the adoption of progressive policies, or what we define as progressive policies, because of our values, because of our moral judgment. But here, to a large extent, I'm suggesting that progressive policies, such as gender equality, tolerance, and diversity, hold the key for human prosperity, regardless of uh, your, uh, uh, your values. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Professor Galor. We have uh, about uh, well, less than 10 minutes for questions. And I got one question on, from online, which I think to some extent already kind of answered at the end, but I ask anyway, is that what is, in, in your view, the origin of the geographic div divergence of population density in 1500 in the world? Was it due to difference in uh, preceding agriculture growth or more due to divergence in climatic and geographical condition? Right, so as I said, I, I addressed this question and uh, my view, as I said before, is an holistic view. The, the, the main uh, uh, emphasis here is on the fact that if we really want to understand inequality today, we really want to resolve inequality today, we have to understand the deep-rooted factors that affected the evolution of each society in the course of human history. And this is, these are institutions, cultural characteristics, geographical elements, and human diversity. These are the key four elements, and ultimately it is holistic view that view each of them as an important element, and again, without understanding the specific history of an individual country, we will not be in a position to permit societies to converge and to evolve very rapidly as they can otherwise. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Gilbert, if you could wait, wait for the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Gilbert, for the fascinating talk uh, gave to us. So uh, uh, I have a question in my mind. Uh, it is uh, globalization. So what do you think of globa globalization in impacting the, uh, like, uh, within country inequality and between country equality? Uh, so this is my question, thank you. Right, so there are two, two elements regarding globalization that I would like to refer to. So the first element of globalization, I will refer it more, more, glo more broadly, so if you think about the era of uh, uh, colonialism and globalization at the same time. What we see is that we see some trade relationships that are emerging between developed and less developed societies, or developed and developing societies. And these trade relationships are uneven for different reasons. Part of the reason is that, in fact, they are based on colonial power, and partly because at that point in time, Developing countries have a comparative advantage in the production of primary goods, agricultural goods. So let me give you a very good example in the context of, uh, of England and the UK. So at a certain point, we see the formation of trade relationship between India and, uh, and England. And in fact, India is a very important trading partner of India at the time. Now, before the formation of this trading partner, in fact, the textile industry in, in India is quite developed. But this trade relationship, whether they are free or otherwise, are inducing India to specialize in the production of primary goods and skill intensive goods. Why is it so important? Because it depresses the demand for human capital. So it depresses the demand for human capital the gains from trade, as a result of it, are converted into more and more people, not into richer people. And since the demand for human capital and human capital investment is so important, the demographic transition in India is delayed to the second part of the 20th century. In, in England, on the other hand, what we see at the time is specialization in industrial goods, human capital intensive goods, and consequently, the demographic transition in 
the UK is occurring probably earlier than otherwise, and a divergence is occurring between these societies. So the main insight here is that the gains from trade are there, but in India they're converted into more people, and in England they're converted into richer people. So this is one aspect of globalization. The second aspect of globalization, which is more contemporary, is how globalization affects inequality within nations. I'm focusing predominantly on inequality across societies, but naturally globalization is associated with inequality within societies. And uh, so if you think about the wheels of change that I underline, namely the pace of technological progress and its ultimate impact on the return to human capital, so this technological acceleration, or what some people call skill-biased technological progress, I prefer to, to refer to as as, as I said, skill bias technological acceleration, because the environment is changing, is gradually increasing the demand for human capital and special abilities and generating inequality uh, uh, between individuals within society as well. Okay, so sorry. That's going to be the last question because unfortunately we are running out of time. That's Thank you very much. Uh, oh, well, my question was about uh, a small prescription you made regarding climate change, uh, which is that if we will be buying, buying scientists more time if the population is under control and, uh, um, uh, and we, sorry, I can't remember the second one, but yes, if about po my question is about population. So some countries uh, today are, uh, are facing very aging societies, have highly aging societies, and uh, to accelerate economic growth, they 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 are prescribing greater uh, reprodu. I mean, they they would prefer they would prefer to have higher reproduction rates. Uh, so and that would then probably be uh, a disadvantage for the uh, for the globe for Earth as a whole to battle climate change. So I mean, isn't there a conflict between uh, not necessarily growth and climate change? Yeah, so not Sorry. necessarily because indeed societies that are dropping well below replacement level may have some concerns that I do not share. But let's ignore it for a moment. But I'm referring to the drop of population growth of the world as a whole. So societies that at the moment are well above replacement level will drop gradually in their population growth below replacement level. And those societies that are deep below replacement level, whether they will rebound a little bit and will remain below replacement level, the general trend uh, will persist. So again, so when I'm referring to a population trend that will basically permit societies to have uh, more time for the development of revolutionary technology that we cannot envision at the moment, I'm referring to this trend, I'm referring to the adoption of environmentally friendly technologies that, that are must, I'm referring to environmental regulations that will be adopted and are being adopted at the moment. All this trend should be there, we should be very vigilant about it, but my hope, again, is, uh, is based on the fact that this trend in both the power of innovations and in fertility decline are promising in terms of the development of these technologies that we cannot fully envision. And I simply want to, to suggest that if we think about humanity 100 years ago, humanity could not have envisioned many of the technologies that we, that we employ today. They would appear entirely uh, 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 out of the scope of individuals. And I do not think that we fully understand what will be the technologies at our disposal uh, three or four decades from now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for Professor Galor for the lecture and the answer to the question. And uh, this, section, uh, this session concludes. <laughs>